Uh, okay, so we'll start on this one, mobile web design and development. And I'll start off uh, as I like to do with a little bit of a history lesson because I think it's useful to understand where we've come from to be able to have some sort of understanding of where we are and where we're going. And so I start this by talking about uh, two things essentially, the, uh, the cell network technology and then the devices that connect to them. So, so you've got your, your cell networks and the devices themselves and there's, uh, there's technological incremental technological uh, improvements between both of those and they feed off each other and as one progresses it's generally as the cell networks progress uh, they support you know more uh, more features and then allow phones to take better uh, better use of, of those features and then that's sort of a positive feedback loop where you get faster networks and then better devices. So I'll just very briefly talk about the networks. We hear, we hear things like 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, um, and these, the G standing for generations of networks. Now they're by no means hard and fast definitions of, of what constitutes any of these things. So uh, even within a certain generation, uh, you've got a whole bunch of different technologies and a whole bunch of different speed ranges. But we can generalize it down to that the, the, the trend as you progress through the networks is you get more speed and bandwidth allowing you to have uh, send more data and then have more responsive and more uh, applications that, uh, that resemble more the, the types of applications that you'd be used to uh, on, on, on sort of a desktop uh, experience. So let's look at the evolution of mobile devices. So you could, as with, as with most things, as I said with uh, the sort of history of the internet, you could trace it as far back as you want. Uh, you know, you've, you've had mobile sort of devices way back for even a hundred and more years. The first kind of ones uh, were developed by um, the, the, the guy who essentially founded the Ericsson company and his idea of a mobile device was essentially a phone that you took around and you threw a, threw a wire over a, over a telephone line and you tap into that and so you could have a, you have a phone conversation um, as long as you were somewhere near a phone line. But in terms of what we, we consider a, a modern mobile device, generally we, we start around the early 1970s with something that looks remotely like what we would have as a mobile device today. So I've broken these down into eras that, you know, again, they're kind of variable, but, but let's say this kind of ranges from, from, well, 1973 we can say is when this particular device, the Motorola Dynatac, uh, was first invented. And so we call this the brick era because obviously they're about the size and the weight of a brick. Uh, but they were the first thing that was somewhat useful as a mobile phone. Um, obviously they weren't very highly adopted, you, they're not what you would probably call portable or, mo or mobile by any stretch of the imagination today, but they had some novelty value and, and certain sectors of the community uh, use them. Does anyone know what the bottom picture is from? Yeah, so the, the, the original Wall Street movie from the 1980s where Gordon Gecko uh, has his uh his his phone, so I guess that's a lesson why you don't put technology in movies because it dates them. Any movie over the last thirty years, probably the easiest way to date it is look at the mobile phones that they use. But I, I guess the the initial sort of target market for these kind of phones were your you know your Wall Street bankers who needed to be able to you know, stay plugged into the stock market and so forth and also because it was kind of, I suppose, novel and cool back then. But um, no, nowhere, near, nowhere near something like mainstream adoption because at the same time when these devices first came out, there was very little in the way of cellular networks. So the, the areas that you could actually use them were not particularly useful anyway. Okay, but you have to start somewhere and, and that's kind of where they started. Oh, the top picture is the guy who uh, invented it, by the way. 
Uh, and then we move on to where you might say that, the, that mobile devices became mainstream. So you might refer to this as the candy bar era, which is from the very late 80s through the 90s. So components became smaller, batteries became better, you ended up having something which could actually fit in your pocket. Um, and so it was around this time where mobile devices sort of gained a critical mass. There were enough people that were using them that it became a viable market. And this is when things like SMS first became introduced, which was the first example of non-voice communication over a cellular network. So, so that, I guess you could say, is the precursor to uh, internet communication over the cellular network as well. So it was the first, first instance where people went, hey, we could use these for something other than talking. Then we progress on and we get to what you might call the feature phone era, which is late 90s to sort of towards the end of, of the, the last decade. And this is again when obviously networks were, in, networks were increasing in, in coverage and speed and then also engineering was allowing devices to be smaller, have more processing power and people realised that a way to market cell phones was to add more features into them. Okay, if my phone does more than your phone, then then that's a, a more attractive phone. Um, so started to see things like cameras being added, uh, the addition of packet switch data services uh, to networks, allowing the use of internet on the phone. Um, so a very, very early and very crippled version of the internet on the phone, but uh, it, w it was the, the start of, of, of that. Um, and I guess uh, some of the things that held it back was that there was um, little innovation and inconsistent interpretation of agreed upon standards. So at this time you, you had, partly due to, partly due to the um, the, the low power of the phones, but also because of the ways that networks wanted to control what you access, you didn't really have access to the real internet, you had access to kind of the fake in internet. Sim similarly to what AOL did when they first started, um, uh, first started being a, a desktop internet ISP, uh, you'd have access to their little version of the network and, and they wanted you to stay within that and not really access the global internet. So you'd have things like OptusU where you log on and yes, you're logging onto their network, but it's a very specific set of features uh, that you can actually access. So, you know, and they, they thought, oh, what do people want? Oh, they'll download ringtones and look at news and weather updates and stuff. And so you had the development of uh, sort of alternative uh, internet standards to, to HTML. So you had the thing called um, WAP and w WML. Uh, so that's uh, wireless uh, wireless airline protocol, I think, and, and uh, wireless markup language. So a very rudimentary subset of, of what HTML already did as a way of coping with the, um, the, the reduced capacity of the, of the devices to actually uh, display and um, render uh, those web interfaces. So as you can understand, it was a little bit of a novelty. So yes, it was something that was nice to have, but it wasn't something that was really efficient or fast or user friendly. And so there wasn't there wasn't a huge like while these phones sold like wildfire, there weren't a lot of people who were going around using them every day to access their email and, and stuff like that. So we move on to uh, what you might call smartphone era, which is sort of early two thousands and you could say to the present, I guess they're, they're kind of a dying thing now and it's, it's a little bit hard to, to, to define exactly what is a smartphone, but, um, but I've given you some examples of the types of phones that I'm talking about. So they're obviously moving from, they're trying to move from something which is just a voice communication device to a multi-purpose, uh, multi-purpose computing device and uh, internet connectivity device. Um, so you started to see you started to see things like the use of common operating systems over multiple phones. So previously there was usually a proprietary operating system for every different phone model, which made it very difficult to create any sort of applications for. 
but you start to see things like uh, Symbian OS on Nokia, uh, you had Windows Mobile and ARM had their own one and Blackberry. So things like this, uh, you usually saw things like the addition of a full QWERTY keyboard. Uh, so because obviously it takes a long, long time to type in a URL just using a, a, a T9 style typing on the, on the number pads. Um, so the addition of a QWERTY keyboard helped that a little bit, although you can see that that was still very small and cramped. Uh, you start to see consistent frameworks for creating applications and services and a reusable structure to innovate. Uh, they still generally used uh, the, the WAP specification rather than your regular HTML. So they were still using a broken down subset of, of what you might consider the real internet. Uh, so you ended up having protocols like um, X, XHTML MP, which uh, stands for XHTML Mobile mobile platform, I think. Anyway, it doesn't matter what the acronym stands for, but essentially a subset of the, the XHTML um, standard that was used on desktop browsers. Uh, and you start to see them supporting things like CSS. So there is a trend towards trying to have the internet capabilities of what you would have on a desktop browser on the phone. Um, but you still had you still had poor standards compliance. So again, different phones would support different parts of different specifications, uh, and they didn't really care about collaborating so much. So again, you had more features with a bit more user friendly, but still these weren't the kind of devices unless you really loved your device where you were going to go around all day using it to do do frequent tasks. If you had one of these phones. Uh, you know, you probably still likely, if you wanted to check your email, maybe it'd be the kind of thing where let's say, oh, I know I can check my email, I know I could look something up, but it's going to take so long that I'll probably just wait till I get home to do that anyway. Um, so it was there, it was nice to have if you needed it, but you probably still weren't likely to use it very frequently. Uh, so I'll just, just diverge a little bit and talk a little bit about the development of, of different web browser software on mobile platforms. So these are some uh, these are some photos of different web browsers, different early web browsers uh, on various different mobile devices. So you can see how differently they they end up rendering uh, the web content. And so uh, in, in almost all of these cases, they, they strip out any, any style sheets and, and they sort of reduce it to plain text and images. So they go chronologically from left to right. So you've got very early one, which is NetHopper for the Apple Newton, which was uh, their, their first attempt at, at a um, PDA or a tablet device, um, which was maybe a good idea, but probably ahead of its time. But uh, as, as far as I can tell, that was the first example of a, a web browser on a, on a mobile device. And then you had Pocket Internet Explorer, which operated on the Windows mobile operating system. And then Opera Mini, which was adopted by uh, a bunch of different phone manufacturers, uh, particularly uh, Nokia. Um, but you can see they, they never really, up to this point, displayed what something that would be indistinguishable from what you would you, you would see using the uh, browsing the browsing the web on a desktop computer. So this is just a chart showing you all of the different uh, attempted standards at creating some sort of uh, specification language for displaying web pages on mobile devices. So as is usual with any new technology, a whole bunch of people will will. Uh, um, propose different standards and everyone thinks there's the best. Sometimes they'll merge, sometimes they'll deviate. But you can see with how many that there were going concurrently how difficult it was going to be to get some sort of consistency across rendering uh, web pages across multiple different devices. So you can see your, so you can see your, uh, that there was attempts to use normal HTML and then there was various different mobile pro profiles of XHTML and then some of your other non-HTML standards like WML and a couple of others never even heard of. And then there was attempts to get Flash working on, quite early on, having Flash working as a, as a web platform on, on mobile phones as well. 
<clears throat> so we're, I guess we're finally at a point where this is kind of converged so that there's, this is a lot less fragmented um, now. And we, we've got obviously devices now where you can essentially code the same website for a desktop and a mobile device and you can display it on both. So this fragmentation issue uh, is something that always happens and, and in, in a way has to happen because people need people you know need to propose different ways of doing things and then and then at the same time the technology is progressing so much that you know what's what's the best thing for something now might not be the best thing for something in a year's time but uh, the whole the whole mobile device industry is matured enough now fortunately very fortunately for us as developers to a point where this is is um, no longer such an issue and so finally we get to the era that we're still in now which is the touch phone era so this obviously started with the introduction of the iPhone uh, in 2007 and you only have to take a look at any phone shop now to see that you know pretty much any high-end phone now looks something like this um, so the iPhone the iPhone was a, a revolutionary device obviously okay it's changed the way that mobile um, that we use mobile phones but it's but it's not so much the engineering behind it. in a way it, in, in a little way it is it's the engineering behind it it's uh, you know the way they marketed it, the way they way they sold it. But I would argue that the the thing that made this the most in in the most way a revolutionary device was <clears throat> not necessarily adding features, but having an interface which finally made the mobile device uh, easy and quick enough to use that it's not just something that's nice to have there. It's something that actually is a more efficient way of doing certain tasks than it would be to just wait and, and go, uh, go over to your um, desktop computer. So as an example of that, you might say, you know, you might say, let's say you're sitting down watching a movie, you want to look up some details about the movie, you might want to look up IMDB. If you had a phone which was a generation or two older, it would take you 20 minutes to type in the URL, it would be really slow to load. You go, you go, I won't bother, I'll miss half the movie by the time I figure out what I want, I'll just wait till later and I'll go and look it up later on. Okay, but with, with a device such as this, then, you know, yes, it's faster, um, yes, the display is easy to read, it can render uh, web, web pages uh, a lot better, but it's the interface to accessing that information, the, the time and the, the mental effort that takes is, is lowered enough that this now becomes a device that you will prefer to use over say a desktop computer to actually access information. And so I think that more than anything has has made this type of device um, finally a viable viable mainstream device and you know and they have to look around and, and see everyone using pulling out their phones all the time and using it uh, to kind of see that 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 is the case um, so what have I got written here so though the majority of technology in the original iPhone had already been available from other manufacturers what was notable about the iPhone was how it changed everyday perceptions of what mobile technology can do um, it made using the mobile web worthwhile from a consumer standpoint okay so consume consumer is a big point there so you had you had you know people who had their PDAs and and smartphones before that might have used them a lot, but <clears throat> but this phone was really the first one where it was widely adopted by your casual user base, um, and then they started using the phone for the same thing that maybe a generation of specific people beforehand would have used uh, other devices for. Um, so it made developing for the mobile web uh, worth the while from a content provider and developer standpoint. So one of the big one of the big advertising points they said for the for the iPhone was that it had the real web and it was it was really the first web browser that <coughs> would render uh, would render web pages indistinguish indistinguishably from uh, their desktop counterparts. Uh, okay, so there's just a couple of pictures of other ones just to show you that you know obviously we're we're still in this era then 
maybe other advancements that uh, that come where we move away from this particular kind of device. Who knows? Maybe maybe your miniature projectors that come out of phones and laser keyboards and stuff might take over, or Google Glasses, virtual reality. Who knows? But as it stands now, this is the this is the era that we're in. And if you're developing anything for mobile, these are the type of devices that you're going to be uh, likely developing for. Uh, so let's ask ourselves why I develop for a mobile platform. Uh, and really the answer to this is, is simply a numbers thing. So um, a lot of the stats that I've got throughout this lecture are already going to be outdated. So the mobile, the mobile field is moving so fast that you could, you could list off some stats one month and the next month they're outdated. But I've kept them, I've kept them all around the same era as around the, the couple of years after the iPhone was uh, developed just to show you how much of a spike in consumer adoption it really caused. So at around this time we say the 6 billion people on earth, 3.6 billion people own or have access to mobile devices. Of those 1.6 billion and growing rapidly have access to the web through a mobile device. Uh, so that already okay in the in and, and you just think about how few years it's been since mobile devices have been able to do something more than just be a voice communication device. That's 500 million more people than have access to the internet um, connected uh, internet through de uh, desktop computers. Okay, and that, that growth, as you can see in the chart on the right, is just in increasing and increasing. <clears throat> so, purely a numbers thing. Uh, if, 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 if I guess if you want to look at in pure economics, if you're targeting a large market, you've got more option to make revenue, so it's really a numbers game. There are lots and lots and lots of people who have access to mobile devices uh, and, and internet uh, accessible mobile devices. So this quote's probably a little old now and it, it probably doesn't seem very foresightful anymore, but this is probably made 10 years ago and we can see how it's actually come true. So so this guy here is kind of a futurist and makes predictions about the future. And probably to most of you this is not very not particularly surprising, but <clears throat> because we know it's already kind of come true. But uh, he says the mobile phone is, is bigger in reach than the car, the TV, or the internet. It will make bigger changes in the next decade than any of these did. The mobile phone adds the combined utility of the fixed telephone, internet, computer, credit card, and TV. The phone will impact your life in more ways than we can imagine because of its multifunctionality aspect and its reach. So mobile phones, phones as we view them today are really, we don't, we don't view them as phones, we view them as multifunctional devices. So that combined with the fact that there's so many people that have them, that alone is, is your reason to, to target the mobile platform. So just a few more stats here. Um, worldwide, the share of internet paid views originating from mobile devices has increased 148% in the year to December 2009. Okay, so and you you can almost line that up. You can line that up with the release of, of these current era of touch phones that we have, just to see that yeah, okay, it's that tells me that it's finally a viable, useful way of accessing the internet. And of course, that's three years old now. If you extrapolate that graph, it's just going to be going up and up. Now, it's interesting to look at the uh, global population um, versus the mobile population because um, it might surprise you to see that uh, the vast majority of uh, mobile phone users actually come from China and India. And that's purely because about half of the world's population comes from China and India. So it makes sense that they're going to have a lot of mobile phone devices. Now, we can't assume anything about the type of mobile devices that they have, okay, because there's, there's I guess, as you can map socioeconomic um, levels with, with the types of devices that you might have. So you'll find that when you, if you trade in your phone, a lot of those old phones end up in, in places like uh, Africa and, and and sort of poorer countries. Um, so that's something you've got to consider and even within a country um, like India you're going to have a, a, a vast difference between sort of the, the rich and the poor people so you're going to have a wide range of functionality of mobile phones. 
So that's something that you're going to have to have to uh, consider um, depending on where you're going to market your application. Um, but uh, but it, I thought it's just interesting to look at that spread of, of mobile phone users uh, across the globe. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few slides as well. Um, here's another one. Worldwide, the share of internet page views originating from mobile devices increased 148% of the year, uh, December 09. So that's exactly what two slides ago said. But this one here is uh, broken up by different geographic regions. Uh, so you can see you can see some interesting trends in there. So it's it's probably unsurprising that North America has um, is kind of high up there, and and Oceania might be surprising because we've got I guess smallerish population, but um, we're very technologically savvy people, I guess. Um, Europe's up there, but probably a surprising one is the uh, the uh, rapid increase in adoption by uh, African countries uh, might surprise a lot of people. So, so the mobile, so mobile devices really do have a global reach. So that's something you've got to keep in mind um, uh, when when you're um, developing what market you're developing for as well. So don't don't discount countries because you think that they don't they don't use the mobile internet because you'd probably be surprised um, at how much they actually do. Uh, so I've got links. I've got links to all these, so you can actually go on here. This is a really some really great sites, um, Stat Counter and, and this podcast one, which will if you go to these links, you can see updated <coughs> updated versions of these graphs, which uh, extend to in kind of the current current year. Uh, this one is operating system share of the mobile web. So again, you can see if this this fluctuates a lot. So uh, because it is, it is still relatively early days of this technology. No one's really got a big foothold on anything, and so um, you might be surprised to see that Simeon OS still has, or oh, as of 2011 anyway, still had the most uh, in terms of operating system share of the mobile web. Um, and at this point, you can see that that pink line Android uh, just took over, um, uh, just took over iOS. So you can see the iOS started very high because they obviously got in early. They were early innovators of of these particular devices, so they had you know their foot in the door first. Um, but what's interesting about this is then you break it down further, and if you look at purely the amount of data that's transmitted across the internet, then iOS is still way way above the others. So you might infer from that that. Uh, that the people who have iOS devices actually use the internet uh, a lot more, um, but there's more people on these other operating systems that use the internet a little bit. So how these end up relating to the way that you're going to um, target your particular application to people is going to vary, but it's stuff that um, you should kind of keep in mind. Uh, this one is browser share of the market. So Opera, um, Opera there is on top. Um, purely by virtue of the fact that it's probably the one browser that was um, released as a device or platform independent browser. So it's on a lot of different uh, mobile, uh, mobile phones. It's also embedded in a lot of consumer devices. Um, I think the Nintendo Wii uses the Opera browser. Uh, and again, you can see that uh, if you look at the, the difference between iPhone and Android, you can see that again, iPhone had a very early foothold and then Android has uh, now eclipsed it. Uh, these ones broken down by region. So you can see that depending where you're marketing your application, then, then these global stats, if you break them down by geographical region, are gonna be very different. As you can see in Europe there, um, by far, the uh, browser that has the largest share is the Opera browser. Uh, this one's South America, where it's uh, Nokia and Opera. Uh, Asia, which is again Opera and Nokia. Okay, so two two browsers where you probably, if you were just looking at a market like Australia, you possibly wouldn't give them this day and age a second thought. But uh, depending on different regions, then 
then you really might have to consider those. Uh, Japan. Uh, Japan's one of those interesting countries that that innovates very early, but they tend to make their own they tend to make their own technology and their own proprietary technology. So you can see a whole lot of uh, browsers that you've probably never heard of here that are on different devices because they have their own networks, their own browsers, their own arrangements of how their whole mobile ecosystem uh, works. Um, so you can see early on there is a lot of these, but again, even in Japan. Uh, you know, ever since about 2009, um, it's, it's been iPhone and then later on Android, again, that has, has dominated. Um, this is Europe. I thought we did Europe at the beginning, maybe we didn't. Sorry, that was Africa. The very first one was Africa. So this, this one, Africa, is probably unsurprising because of the, the reason I said you before, because a lot of your, a lot of your phones that you, you trade in when you upgrade uh, end up not being recycled for parts, but being recycled as whole phones and resold onto uh, other countries. So it's not surprising that uh, some of the, some of the um, lower socioeconomic uh, countries or, or regions end up having uh, the browsers that match to older generations of phones. Um, okay, Europe, uh, again, probably what you'd expect, this one, North America, uh, North America, it's North America is the one where Blackberry really had something going for a while, but you can see they're tanking a little bit, and now again, it's iPhone and Android, and what's this one? Oceania. So I'm guessing by the fact that these stats have massive peaks and troughs that their sample data isn't as great. Uh, but again, you can see probably unsurprisingly just by thinking of, of, of your friends and yourself and what phones you have that uh, iPhone, iPhone, for some reason iPhone really dominated in, in, in Australia for a long time. I remember my Canadian friend coming out and he's like, does everyone in Australia have an iPhone? And for a while it seemed like that. Um, uh, but uh, again, Android, you can see, is on an upward trajectory as well. Okay, so um, the last thing I'll say about these is, is you've got the links to those. So as part of your research when you're looking at a mobile application and where you want to market it, I would suggest going back and having a look at these sort of stats once you've figured out where you're going to market. Is it going to be a worldwide thing or a particular geographic location? This kind of information is going to be useful for figuring out your potential market, because if you're if you're attempting to if you're attempting to market a, a, a native iPhone application in Africa where only you know less than one percent of the population might actually have it, then you know you're going to be wondering why no one's actually purchasing your app because they don't actually have the capacity to do so. Okay, so. This stuff varies, I guess the main point of all this is that this stuff varies um, on, based on different locations a lot more than it would creating applications for, um, for the desktop um, market. And that's just purely because the desktop market has been established um, for a lot longer. And as a general, as a general rule, you can say that um, the longer a technology has been established, then the less volatile uh, things are going to be within the market. Okay, so identifying target market for your application. The global mobile device market is especially fragmented. Usage trends rarely map neatly across geog geography or demographics such as age, wealth, gender, education, profession, etc. It is therefore critical more so than ever to identify and profile your target users' needs and capabilities. So let's have a little bit of a look at um, some some data relating to how people use the mobile web. So some of the some of the things that you could summarize out of this is that the most common content segments are news, email, weather, sports, city guides, and social networks. And based on those things, mobile users tend to perform quick task-based behaviors, often whilst in between other tasks or multitasking. Okay, so one of the big things we're going to look at is the way that your users are going to be using your app um, 
as opposed to how they might use a, a desktop application. So this is mobile usage in Australia 2009, uh, which found that 43% of online Australians now own a smartphone, 26% of social network users participating in mobile social networking in the past year, uh, and 66% of mobile social networks are under 35 years of age. I would expect that that social network statistic would have changed significantly in the last three years. Um, to the point where just very recently Twitter has, has started cutting off third-party app developers because uh, they've decided that they want to go the advertising revenue model and uh, if, if people are just using a uh, mobile application not actually going to their website then people aren't looking at and clicking on the ads. Um, and that to me says that people have started to use social networks through their mobile devices probably more than they actually use them in desktop devices. Um, and you could think about the, the context in which people are doing social activities, things like checking in, taking photos, all this kind of thing, which makes a lot of sense is why a mobile device is a, is a better interface for uh, social networks than, than maybe a desktop computer. Uh, so there's some more numbers there, which I won't go through. They're there if you want to look at them. Uh, they just basically go over some social media, social media statistics in the mobile device area. And this is another report. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a business business report um, on mobile internet usage in Australia from 2010. It says that 96% of Australian consumers own a mobile phone. Now, if that isn't market saturation, I don't know what is. Um, and of these, 41% use it to access the internet and that was up 26% from the year before so that's a that's a, a very quickly increasing statistic. So I ask this question every year is there anyone who doesn't actually have a mobile phone? Everyone has a mobile phone? So this is the first year when where no one has no one has not had a mobile phone. That's very interesting. So this may not be the most accurate accurate sample but in, in, in this case, 100% of people have mobile phones, so that's very interesting. Okay, so... Okay, so this is in internet applications by phone in the last 12 months, so the types of, types of tasks that people have used their mobile phone for. So accessing information was a key use of the internet on mobile phones with looking for maps, weather and news, the top applications. Social networking was also a highly used application on par with people looking for information on products and services. And I think this is a very interesting statistic actually. Uh, Australians are not just using the internet on their mobile phones when other methods of connection are not available. The most frequently nominated places for Australians to use the internet on their mobile phones was at work or at home, regardless of the fact that they were likely to have other methods to connect to the internet at either of these locations. So that for me just really reinforces what I was saying before about we finally have mobile devices where even though I could walk into another room and, and you know access the internet on my computer, it's now actually more convenient just to stay where I am take out my mobile phone and in a few seconds then I have access to the information that I want there. So I think that that of all the statistics in here is a really interesting statistic. Doesn't mean that people aren't still using them out and about on the go but what that says to me is that is that they're actually legitimately a useful device in their own right now because people are using them when there's, there's other methods of connection um, available. So um, another another interesting statistic that I recently heard was that um, something like 60% of people who are watching TV are multitasking on their phone at the same time, and I know I know I definitely do that. Um, and so again, that doesn't surprise me that because I just think that this is a, an outcome of the fact that we have devices that are now legitimately in their own right a useful device, a more useful device for accessing information than than what a desktop computer um, has been. Okay, so let's talk about developing a mobile strategy. 
So some of the things we want to do is define the user's context, determine the user's goals and how they are altered by the context, determine the tasks the user wants to perform to achieve the goals, and filter content filter your content by context, such as location, media, and model. So when we talk about context, what do we mean? Uh, mobile devices have an unparalleled ability to leverage the context in which information is consumed and produced. Context refers to the surroundings, circumstances, environment, background, or settings which determine, specify, or clarify meaning, a mental model to establish understanding. So we can, we can have things like physical context, so location, so the fact, that your, the fact that your phone can know where you are is one of the most powerful ways of uh, delivering you more relevant information quickly because um, if you're searching for something that's, that's going to be contextually relevant to location, then, um, then your, mobile, your mobile device is going to be able to do that better than then, um, or quicker because it inherently knows where you are than something where you have to tell it where you are. Um, there's media context, so what the device what device is being used to access the content and modal context, which is the user's state of mind. And we'll talk about that a little more in a bit. Uh, so this is this is uh, some good example of uh, location-based context. So. This one on the left, uh, Wikitude. Um, so this is this is one of the this is an application that uses a um, I guess augmented reality. So what this what this does is it um, the phone using your location and also the compass knows a where you are and b what you're pointing at. And so if you're in any particular location, you're let's say you're on holidays, you're near a particular monument, you point your phone at that, then the phone can figure out what it is that you're looking at and then go and pull the Wikipedia article for what that is and overlay it on the screen. Okay, and so that's something that highly relies on the fact that the, that the phone knows your physical context, your location and your direction. Um, so there's, a, there's, there's actually an entire browser called Called Layar, L-A-Y-A-R, uh, which does the same thing and um, allows you, to, allows you to, to, to do this with um, things other than just Wikipedia articles. Um, it can do things like take, take a photo of an object and one with image processing, but two and three because it knows where you are and what, you, and what direction you're pointing. It can identify certain objects. So this Google image search has started doing that as well. Uh, this one on the right is uh, called e eRov, a street history in Semicode. And so this is a project where someone's gone around uh, a, a uh, city with a little bit of history and put, uh, uh, put the 3D barcodes up. And so what you can do is you can scan those and it will deliver you a photo of what the area that you're looking at looked like some time in the past. Okay, and again, that's only going to be relevant because to actually be there and take the photo of that, you, you have to ha your your phone has to have a physical context that's going to relate to that. So it's only by doing that that you can actually see the real thing and then the historical thing side by side. Okay, a little bit more about context. Uh, Basically, there's the who, what, when, where, why, and how that you want to ask yourself. So who are your users? What do you know about them? What type of behavior can you assume or predict? What is happening? What are the circumstances in which they will best absorb the content you intend to present? When will they interact? When they are home and have large amounts of time at work, where they have short periods of focus during idle periods while waiting for a train, for example. Where are they? Are they in a public space or in a private space? Are they inside or outside? Is it day or night? Why will they use your app? What value will they gain from your content or services in their present situation? And how are they using their mobile device? Are they held in the hand or are they in their pocket? Do they need to actually be looking at the screen when the device is functioning? Um, 
sometimes they don't actually have to. So if you think of a think of an app like Runkeeper, which you, you set it to go and then it tracks your progress as you go for a run and lets you know uh, how fast you've gone, how far you've traveled, how many calories you've burned, all this sort of thing, and then charts your progress on a map. So that whole thing really functions. You set it up, yes, looking at the screen, but that, that application actually functions um, mostly with the screen off and you get audio cues. Um, and then there's things like how they're holding it, the physicality of the phone, it's open or closed, portrait or landscape. Um, so there's obviously more ways that you can use a mobile device physically, the way that you can physically hold it or be not holding it, then again, compared to something like a, a classical desktop application. So we can break down application context into, uh, or we, we you could categorize different application context as some of these things. Um, so you've got utility, which is short task-based scenarios minimal input and at a glance information. So some examples of that might be a calculator, clock, or weather forecast, okay, the things which you need information very quickly and you want it presented, you want it presented very quickly without having to punch through a bunch of menus. As uh, locale context, using geolocation data to add contextual information. So for example, find restaurants that are near me. Um, so examples of that are things like Google Maps and Foursquare. Uh, information context, where the only goal is to provide information. So the importance is on, on providing relevant information up front. So things like news, uh, maybe your RSS feeds or Wikipedia, something like that. Uh, then you've got productivity, which is heavily task-based contents and uh, content and services. So stuff where you actually want to perform perform a, a functional task, I would say. So something like searching on eBay, maybe doing your internet banking, uh, maybe a note, uh, maybe a note taking application, okay, things like that. Uh, and then finally, you've got immersive, which is designed to consume the user's attention, uh, often for entertainment purposes. So the obvious example of this is things like games. And that's interestingly the one context where it, it probably breaks away from the, the rest of the examples whereby um, in most of these in most of these you'd expect the user not to be absorbed in the interface for you know half an hour or an hour at a time. You'd expect it to be very short but possibly very frequent uses of the interface. Whereas in, in immersive things like games then that's the one thing you, you would probably expect that it would be something where you have time to sit down and you would be immersed in that and you, you play Angry Birds until your battery ran out. Um, okay, so this is just a table listing uh, some of the various attributes of these different types of context. And I won't go through this in detail, but uh, it lists it based on user experience type, task type, task duration, and what, what it might be combined with. Because your application doesn't necessarily have to have one context. Uh, and, and commonly it will have will have uh, two or more contexts that it might um, apply. Um, okay, so this is this is just a bit of a definition slide: sovereign versus transient applications. Uh, sovereign application monopolizes the user's attention for long periods of time. So, an example of that might be a word presser, word processor. If you're sitting down to you know, write the report for your assignment or write your great novel, then you're probably going to sit down and, and hammer away at that for a significant amount of time. You're probably not going to get in there, write two words, and then come back to it later and write some more. Uh, and then the other type is a transient application, which comes and goes presenting a single high relief function with a tightly restricted set of accompanying controls. The program is called when needed, it appears and performs its job, and then quickly leaves. So examples of that are an instant messaging or an SMS application. You probably use it for anything from a couple of seconds to a couple of minutes, but probably no more than that. So as a general rule, desktop applications tend to be sovereign, while mobile applications tend to be transient. So this is probably one of the big points to keep in mind when you're thinking about your application. Um, not a hard and fast rule, but it's more likely that your your application, you're going to use it in a in, in a very quick sort of way.